Welcome back to the Pokestars.net European Poker Tour. It's the final table of the EPT London main event, and we're watching every single hand here on EPT Live. And if you have just joined us, we are already down to five players. I guess, Joe, there have been four significant hands that we need to talk about. Three of those, the elimination hands. We lost Chris Moorman. Uh, we lost Tama Camel. We lost Christopher Frank. But the other big hand was the hand that saw Steve O'Dwyer double up Olaf Hagland. Hagland O'Dwyer gate. And that big flip, ace-king against queens, has resulted in this guy in the red jersey, Olaf Hagland from Sweden, being the tournament chip leader, and Steve O'Dwyer being the short stack. It's the first hand back from the break. Looks like a raise from Hagland and a call from O'Dwyer. And a queen 5-4 rainbow flop. Blinds up, by the way. 25, sorry, 30-60 with a 10K ante. Maglin continues when O'Dwyer checks to him. Steve will call. I don't think with Steve's stack that he's pure floating too often here. Nine on the turn. Check. Is Hagland going to fire again? I've just noticed, Joe, that Mantis Vizotskis is wearing a bow tie. Yeah, I was wondering what that yellow and green was, but I thought it was the inside of his collar. <laughs> and this is so much better. So check, check on the turn. The king of clubs on the river. Wire checks again. Hagland has chosen to celebrate St. Patrick's Day with his choice of attire. We'll bet the river. A reminder. Blues are 5,000, yellows are 25,000. The green and blacks are worth 100,000 each. So that bet on the river is 325,000. What's well, a big barrel? 325 into 480. And it represents a significant percentage of Steve O'Dwyer's remaining chips. Steve with 1.1 million behind. The hairy beast surveys the board and folds. So Hagland takes more off O'Dwyer, consolidating his chip lead, now playing more than six and a half million. Ruben Visser second on the leaderboard, but just shy of six million. Steve O'Dwyer down to 1.1. Lex Veldhaus has just tweeted. He says, go Ruben Visser and Theo Jorgensen in the EPT London main event. A reminder that Lex will be joining us a bit later on as a guest commentator, but right now we can welcome in an EPT champion, the man who made the top 20 of this tournament, who is gunning for his second EPT title. It's Mike Timex McDonald. Thanks for dropping by, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. 20th place, um, for which I'm sure Jason Mercier gave you plenty of needle. Yeah, there was a little bit of needling, but uh, you know, in his defense, it kind of went both ways. I think anyone who was a casual observer and wasn't watching the live stream and didn't see that it was tongue-in-cheek may think, wow, what's the beef between McDonald and Mercy? Twitter war. <laughs> yeah, well, I, was, uh, I was half expecting to, you know, like sign on the computer and see there be a thread on 2 plus 2 about it. But yeah, there were like maybe 100 people who, were, who commented on that fight, but it, yeah, it was all just good fun. We've got Noel in here. Vissa raised the button. Steve O'Dwyer shoved. 
Theo Jorgensen calls. Ruben gets out of the way. So Steve O'Dwyer a risk here. Theo woke up with aces in the big blind. Ace deuce the hand for Steve O'Dwyer. And that's just bad, bad news when the guy who's not even in the pot yet just snap calls you. Yeah, that's not, not exactly the hand Steve wants to be up against here. Steve O'Dwyer came second at EPT London in season eight. Here in season nine, he was looking to go one better. He might have to make do with a fifth place finish unless we see a very funky flop. Well, there is a deuce. Slightly funky. Theo smiles. <laughs> the last time Theo made an EPT final table, he had aces cracked. Just has to fade a deuce on the river. That's the card that Steve wants if he's going to survive. <laughs> deuce, please, as he sips his tea. Very polite boy. The river is a queen. So Theo Jorgensen eliminates Steve O'Dwyer in fifth place. And huge props to Steve to make the final table of a very tough tournament two seasons in a row is no small achievement. In fact, I can think of another player who did that, Mike McDonald <laughs> in Dortmund in seasons four and five. But uh, the difference between our accomplishments is, you know, he made the final table in back-to-back -back tough tournaments. Dortmund 2008, 2009, maybe, maybe not so tough. So congratulations, Steve. £146,000 for fifth place. And Ruben Visser closes the gap on Hagland. And Theo Jorgensen up to £4.1 million now with the as the beneficiary of O'Dwyer's chips. And the important thing to say now about the table dynamic, Mike, is that no one has shy of 50 big blinds. After those early eliminations, now we're probably in for a deep run of four-handed poker. Yeah, it looks like average stack is, what is it, like 80 or 100 big blinds or something like that? This, could, this the one could go on for a while. Thank God we've got uh, Mike in here who can talk us through some of the action that's going to happen now that we won't be having all-ins every few seconds. Well, let's talk yeah. about some of the players, Mike, because obviously you've come up against these guys having gone deep in this tournament, and we know their biographical information. We've seen their results. But what do they like to play against? So, yeah, the uh, I, honestly, I would say that as far as who made the final four here, it's probably some of the people that I played with the least throughout the tournament. Like, historically, I've played with Ruben a lot online, and I don't think we played any hands together in this tournament um so like i don't i didn't have any experience with him in this tournament but i played with him a lot i think he's a really good aggressive tough player uh theo is someone i think i played with him maybe a little bit four or five years ago and maybe an hour or two in this tournament and i think he's another very good player as well the other two guys weren't at my table at all so you know none of the four players did i play with very much throughout this tournament but you know from what i've heard from you know updates i've seen and talking to other players it sounds like we've got a pretty tough final four Absolutely, with Theo Jorgensen going for the Triple Crown. If he wins this title, he'll have all three EPT, WPT, and World Series. Raise from Ruben Visser. Which, uh, which WPT did he win? Paris. Oh, okay, gotcha. Oh, that was pretty recent, right? Like the last he actually made back-to-back -back final tables. Not back-to-back? -back? No, he won it in 2010 and then made the final table again in 2012, 2012. and was the runner-up. Oh, sick. And his World Series bracelet, I believe it was a £5,000 PLO event at the World Series of Poker Europe one year. Oh, you didn't say it was a Europe bracelet. <laughs> what, <laughs> you mean? Got to put the asterisk yeah, inside there. You on. mean those fields that are actually tougher? <laughs> right, all 12 players are usually very tough. We're going to discount Theo's bracelet win, then we're going to start arguing about Davide Katai's WPT win again. What happened with his WPT? Well, well, he won the Celebrity Invitational. Okay. And so there was some debate at the time, but the official line from the World Poker Tour themselves is that they consider it to be a full WPT title, so... Well, there feels like 800 people or something for that thing, so... Yeah, it's probably, you know, it's probably tougher than some of them. Like, it's not as if it was one of those, you know, season two ones where you invite six guys... And right, the a author's WPT. night. That yeah. does not count. That is not a WPT the, title. The, the young guns of poker where the average age is 35 or something <laughs> like that. That's just a fun TV show. <laughs> Action folded to the small blind, Olaf Hagland. The black chips are 100,000, I'm assuming? They are indeed. Right. 
didn't quite make it far enough in the tournament to recognize that. Look at all the room Theo's got to mess around with his chips now. He's in heaven down there. <laughs> now all the chip tricks. Yeah. There's been a bit of a debate this week on Twitter as we go to a flop here, heads up between Hagland and Vissa. There's no debate. Everyone universally hates the way Mike puts his chips in. <laughs> no. Well, the debate is, and you can join the debate, hashtag EPT Live or email nuts at pokestarstv.tv. What is more annoying, the way Mike McDonald bets or Theo Jorgensen's chip shuffling? Yeah, I mean, it, it's the... got to be the way I bet. I would assume. Yeah. <laughs> and I if not, was, he'll make sure it is. I was, I was sure it was going to be, you know, the way I bet or the way I stare, and that might be a little bit closer. But I'm sure either of those are more annoying than his chip tricks. Mike McDonald wears it like a badge. <laughs> I am the most annoying player at the table, hands down. By the way, a lot of people uh, were very keen on our caption competition yesterday. And we had a picture of ourselves taken with David Williams, and we invited people to send in a caption. Now, I don't think we have any prizes available for today's competition, so this one might just be for fun. But we've decided we are going to do another caption contest. So we're going to have our photograph taken in the booth with Mike Timex McDonald. Oh, we do have prizes, by the way. It's not just for fun. We're going to be giving more stuff away. We've got more DVD box sets to give away. So we... Myself and Joe Stapleton are going to give our best Mike McDonald stares to Mike McDonald. Uh-oh. Okay. Do I hold the mic up? I don't know how you do it. My eyes were watering after two <laughs> seconds. Oh, those, those, those are good. Those are good. <laughs> I'm intimidated already. So we'll get that picture up ASAP. And I imagine we'll if you were anything like me and the, the fact that my eyes water within three seconds, that's not intimidating. Like a, a, <laughs> a guy staring at you, scary. A guy crying, not as scary. Slightly less scary, I would agree, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think actually that might work. It's like, why is he crying? It would, it would, it would totally discombobulate you. <laughs> What's the more annoying move? Mike's stare, Theo's chip shuffling, or Stapes' sobbing? <laughs> No, then I might have some competition for most <laughs> annoying player at the table. Please don't call me, please. <laughs> We've got people joining all the time asking what's happened. People asking where is Chris Mormon. Here's the thing, guys. If a player is not at the table, <laughs> chances are it's because they busted. We are down to four already. Wait, Mor where is Mormon? What happened? He was the first one out. He's probably drinking at the bar, to be fair. Uh, he was joined by Tama Kamel, the other Englishman. And then we lost Christopher Frank, the German, and at the start of this level, the 30-60-10 level, we lost Steve O'Dwyer in fifth place, taking us to our final four. You know, and the two short stacks went out first, which doesn't happen as often as you would think, actually. How many times in the EPT do we see some short stack just hang around through a couple of coolers and ladder his way up at least one or two spots? But yeah, the two English guys, they were the short ones coming in. Mormon lost a race. I think uh, Camel got it in not so good, if I remember. After blinding way down, Steve O'Dwyer lost a huge flip to all of Hagland, ace-king versus queens, and then eventually ran ace-deuce into aces. Theo Jorgensen, who did I miss? I skipped someone. Chris Frank. Chris Frank, that's right. He was flipping ace-king against nines. So this was an unraised pot pre-flop. Theo just calling in the small blind. No betting action on the flop. Theo bets 75k on the turn, and he bets the river as well. And obviously, Mantes Vysotskis very proudly supporting Lithuania, and he's got the Lithuanian colors in that bow tie. Love a good bow tie. Underutilized move. And he can't beat a pair of sevens. Uh, some response on Twitter. JW says, I love the Jorgensen chip slide, but I do find the skyhook betting motion a bit annoying. Uh, ben Newman ranks the most annoying thing as being Theo's stupid chip antics, and the second most annoying thing is the Timex stare. That's not a, that's not a sky hook, by the way. That is a skill crane. And Retrobyte, I'm flattered. Retrobyte <laughs> says, I love you, Mike, but you look slightly autistic when you stare. <laughs> you know, it does help to be good at poker if you have a little of those tendencies in you. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, he you know, he may he may very well be right. I'm not too sure about that one.
Well, let's give a little props to Mike for being such a good sport, by the way, and not <laughs> storming out of here immediately. I mean, you know, when uh, when I spend so much time hanging around with the Mad Dog, it's kind of uh, it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of inevitable that now, I'm used to some see, needling. Now I see the uh, the true motive and coming in, and you can th get, take some shots at Mike Watson while you're in here. It, it, exactly. Yeah. You know, he's uh, he's off grinding the turbo or something like that. Got to got to hate on him a little bit. <laughs> Jorgensen raising the button. Arf arf. Arf, arf. <laughs> and both lines folding. If you got a question for Mike, by the way, EPT Live is the hashtag on Twitter. Nuts at Pokestars.tv is the email address. We we're thrilled to have your dad watching the live stream yeah, he's over got, the last few days. He's got to be, you know, the, the biggest supporter of the EPT of anyone out there, I think. Like, he's... You know, he's always like he's always tweeting. I'm sure he took part in the Twitter competition yesterday and is probably taking part again today. He's uh, he loves these broadcasts. Like I'm sure, you know, he's he's watching it as avidly whether I'm there or not. And our free roll password uh, the first day of the broadcast was Waterloo. Oh really? Yeah, I, it was based on the tube stop here in London, but I was immediately reminded of your hometown. Is that where your dad's watching from? Yeah, exactly. I'm sure he's probably just you know pretending to work right or. Is it a weekend? Yeah, today's a weekend, so he's probably not pretending to work. <laughs> but nor normally he would probably be watching this from his cubicle. By the way, today's free roll password is Oval. If you want to register, registration is now open. You'll find the tournament in the EPT section of the Pokestars tournament lobby. O-V-A-L, all lowercase, Oval, is today's free roll password. Haglund raising small to big, and Ruben Vesta defending. Seven, eight, three. By the way, I think Danish poker fans are getting very excited about the prospect of Theo Jorgensen not just winning this tournament but joining the Triple Crown Club. Yeah, that's that's an exclusive club. How many people are there now that have done that? Well, we had Jake Cody with us yesterday, who I think became the third member, and I think Davide Katai became the fourth. So okay. Theo would become Triple Crown winner number five. Gotcha. That's yeah, that's surprising how few people have done that so far. Gavin Griffin. And Roberto Romanello, I think. No, Roland it's DeWolf. The, uh, Roland DeWolf. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. My bad. They're similar characters, though. <laughs> talkative guys. Yeah, talkative British guys. Okay, yeah. Won a lot of tournaments. Yeah. So Hagland continued for 160,000 on the flop. Ruben called. Jack on the turn. Not a great card. Aglin slows down. You could very easily see Ruben defending and calling on the flop with a lot of hands that a jack would connect with. Six on the other hand of that range. The other end of that range. I'd say with this pot, it's pretty like it gets checked down and Ruben wins with a 7 or a 6. There's the 7. And yeah, it was, uh, yeah, there, I mean, on that on that turn, it's pretty tough for Hagelin to continue there. Like, I think I think that's a board where against someone like Ruben, like, I think a lot of people, they see the low cards on the board and they're just going to see bet, you know, 100% of their bluffs. But someone like Ruben, I think, will be pretty tough to play there. Like, he's going to have, he's going to have a gut shot a lot. He's going to float probably any two over cards he'll have, and he's going to make it he also probably bluff raise the flop occasionally, so it's it's tough for like Heglin to you know be able to take that pot down if he just has like a completely airy hand. It's uh, you know playing. I like the fact that he raised you know bigger than some MTT players do from the small blind because Ruben's going to be tough to play against out of position. Like some guys who you know min raise the small blind, they're just going to get you know destroyed by a good player out of position. So the fact he raised a little over two and a half x there. I think is uh, is good strategy on his part. So you just want to make him play a little bit bigger pot. Exactly. Yeah. Like you don't, you know, when you're when both ranges are really wide, stacks are really deep, you you know you may as well just you know push your equity advantage pre flop a little bit by making the pot a little bigger. Under the gun raise from Vizotskis. Called by Ruben in the small. You can see the patented Theo Jorgensen squeeze. No, he folds the big blind. Heads up to the flop. <laughs> Sean writes in with a question for Mike McDonald. Why are you so sick? 
I mean, uh, I, I have no idea. That is just an excellent question. Playing, uh, just play the game a lot, try my best. Uh, I don't really have a good answer beyond that. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually probably, you know, so many hours spent listening to Steeps' commentary. Yes. It taught me so much to become oh, man, the, I'm surprised the, gr that the you, great player that I you am That you cashed at all if you listen to my commentary. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how I got to be so sick. And, you know, to the viewers at home, just pay attention to everything that Steve says, and you'll one day be so sick, too. I can totally understand how Steve's commentary could make you sick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always have to give a little bit of a shout-out. If you're talking about the TV commentary, I get a lot of help with those hands from uh, Jimmy Fricky from Gobble Boy, so I certainly can't take all or any of the credit. <laughs> Yeah, and Jimmy's a great guy. One of the first guys I knew, like I knew within poker. He was I probably, you know, known him since I was 16 and he was 18. He helped he helped my poker game a lot when I was, you know, kind of coming up through the ranks. He's got a great poker mind. Absolutely. So Vizotskis's raise was called by Ruben, as we said, and Ruben check 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 raises the flop. Vizotskis continued for 140,000. Ruben's made it 385 total. So I would say I'd say Ruben here has a mixture of like, you know, queen jack six six type hands, and then like ace ten type hands. I think he'll. Uh, He's gonna semi bluff the gut shot. I think he'll. Yeah, I think if he, I think he'll definitely be, especially like I don't know what uh, Viscakis's uh, C bet tendencies are like, but you know, the way that, I guess most tournament players do, they probably just continuation bet a few too many hands. So I think that you know with some ace ten king nine type hands, uh, Ruben would be three betting, uh, like raising the flop. And I also think when he calls preflop, he'll have a lot of sort of one pair hands, but I doubt he's check raising too many of the one pair hands on the flop. Uh, I think I think definitely Ruben would be more likely to check raise like a king queen type hand for value than a lot of players would be. Uh, like I think a lot of tourney players will always check call that. I think he, especially if he thinks the C bet seems more like a weakish value hand, would be willing to go for thinner value than a lot of people. Now you said something really interesting there. You said that he'll take advantage of the fact that some players see bet too much, and that's something you don't really hear uh, uh, for you know worded that way. See betting too much, so that is a thing, huh? Yeah, I mean, I a lot of you know, oh, yeah, it's kind of, it's sort of kind of uh, expected when people talk about the game that like you know it's you raise pre flop and then you follow it up with a see bet, but you know if that's what you're doing. You're just going to get owned by people who you. That's know, exploitable, check. also. Exactly, yeah. Like any anything you're doing, there's usually a way of exploiting it, and usually c betting, you know, everything. Like if you're c, like, you know, let's just say you're c betting. Uh, let's just say take take a hand like Jack Ten or something like that. If you're c betting that hand and folding it to a check raise, then you're going to be getting, you know, you're going to be getting owned by someone who's check raise bluffing you a lot if you're betting 100 percent. And then if you're say, you know, uh, c betting Jack Ten and calling a check raise then you're going to be getting exploited by someone who check raises, you know, queen 10 for value or something like that. So it really, you know, it really, uh, I'm not saying that you should, should always be checking a hand like that. I'm just giving an example of right. how someone who just c-bets anything, you'll take advantage of the fact that most of the time you don't have anything. And, you know, with his check raise to 385, he's risking 385 to win close to 500 or something. So he's just getting a really good price on the bet against someone who's a very frequent c-better. Well, Ruben has led the turn for 445,000. I would, I would say, I, I can't, I would say with the, with the bet of 445, I would guess that that makes it a little more likely to be value on the turn than I would have guessed. I think it's something like, if he's like, it looks like a bet where he doesn't mind getting called. Um, but again, I wasn't sure exactly what uh, Viscaucus's stack is, so I, I could be wrong about that. Two million. Okay. Yeah, I guess I guess if it's only two, I thought they were a little deeper. If it's only two million, there's not that much sense in you know betting six hundred thousand on the turn. So you can, I can't really read into the bet too much. Yeah, Vizotskis is the shortest stack at the table with two million. Ruben Visser, by the way, has just taken the chip lead with that pot up to six point seven million. Haglund now in second place with six point three, and Theo Jorgensen up to four point three, an eighty-six big blind stack. So yeah, now here, I mean, I would I would say I would say in this tournament, I find I think this EPT relative to a lot of them seems to have a pretty big uh second place payout like the payout to second the jump from third to second is almost the same as the jump from second to first so i would guess as a result of that you're not going to see that many giant collisions between the two big stacks like i think i don't think you know i think uh reuben and Haglin, neither of them want to pay play like a 13 million chip pot that determines you know who gets 700 who gets 200 when you know you can likely coast around and 
have a, a better chance at walking up the 450 payout before playing the giant pot. So I would say, you know, say the payouts went, you know, 700, 300, 200 or something like that. Then you'd see people playing a much more aggressive 4-bet, 5-bet type strategy than with this. Three-way action here. Haglund's under the gun raise called by Visser on the button and Vizotskis in the big blind. Jack 10-4 on the flop. So you're saying there's some legitimate reason to try to ladder out of where we're at right now. Yeah, I mean, I would say all all four players obviously do, you know, do want the title, do want to be, do want to get their like, you know, EPT win. But I would say that, like, I would say when there are you know bigger jumps, there's more incentive to stick around. Yeah, I would agree through there. Everyone check the flop. Seven of hearts on the turn. Zotskis to speak first. Looks like he'll lead at this. His bet is 175,000. Haglund folds and Visa folds as well. Uh, by the way, Nat has observed on Twitter that the graphics don't appear to be automated. Absolutely. Uh, we manually input the information. And again, we salute our graphics team, Gregor and Nick over there. Give them a round of applause, everyone. Doing awesome work. They do their best to get the details in as fast as they can and as accurately <laughs> as possible. I was a little late, sorry. Nat also observes that maybe it's just the camera angles, but Ruben's got a full-on man of steel jawline going on there. <laughs> yeah, he's got, a, he's got a nice jawline, definitely. I like that. That's why I wear a beard, is because I have a very weak jawline. <laughs> Oh my word, we missed a Triple Crown winner. <laughs> How off-brand is this? Elkie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Elkie, uh -oh. of course, won that stud bracelet in the World Series in 2011, so he joined the Triple Crown Club. So there are actually five already. Gavin Griffin, Roland DeWolf, Jake Cody, Elkie, and Davide Katai. Are we sure we didn't miss another one, too? Because I almost felt like there were six <laughs> when Davide Katai won. I'm pretty sure that they are the five. So huge apologies to Elke. Uh, to be fair, we did give him that pot noodle earlier in the week. So that's <laughs> consider that compensation for us overlooking your achievement. Of course, Elke's a triple crown winner. How could he not be? <laughs> You're against a raises button. It's three bet by Haglin. And Mike, considering that these guys are so deep, are we going to see a lot of like? raise three bet falls or are we going to see a lot of raise three bet calls and just sort of you know multi street play um i mean i would say i'd say there will definitely be uh there will be a mixture of both i would say you know a spot like this like where they're where it's out of position they're so deep stacked and he three bets pretty small i wouldn't expect theo to fold very often uh, but then again, you know, I, I can't say for certain. Sure. When it's, you know, when, yeah, they're about, you well, know, especially knowing 80, Theo too, yeah. Yeah, 80 big blinds deep. Hegland re raised, I think, a, a lot smaller than some people would in that situation. So I think that, you know, a spot like that, I think you'll see a lot of calling. If it's something like cutoff opens button three bets or small blind opens big blind three bets, then I think you'll see, you know, some more folds and people are in right. position. Cool. Haglund first, the act, first to act with the betting lead. And this, and this is a spot where it's, uh, you know, it's it can be tough to be in Haglund's shoes here. Like you, he's, you know, with with even with a lot of the value hands he's three betting that you know aren't like ace queen or better essentially. There's this isn't ne like a, this isn't a very exciting flop. Like even this deep stack, even with like aces, like obviously you're happy, but you're not you're not that excited to play like a nine million chip pot on this board. And Theo can have such a wide variety of hands. Like Theo can have, you know, Theo can have all the gut shots. He can have, you know, he can have two pair. He can have yep. most. He can have basically all the sets. Like there's no guaranteed even four bet queens free flop, and pretty much any any card that's not a seven or lower non spade, Theo can have strong hands here. Um, so it's really just, you know, it's that's yeah. Heglin can definitely you know get in some situations where he may fold the best hand, like, like on a turn card like this. He's, you know, on 
he's so easily, you know, if, say he bets and Theo raises, like if he bets, you know, 700, uh, Theo makes it like 1.4 or something. He's really in a tough spot, you know, even with his over pairs. Um, it's just, uh, it's a it's a pretty tricky situation, and that's just what happens with, you know, deeper stacks out of position. Right, other than, you know, a, a queen 10 or a 10 in your hand, you hate almost anything when you get raised. Exactly, yeah. And I would say that, you know, I would I would guess he's probably not through bidding a queen 10 type hand. Like, I would guess when he has a 10, he probably has something like a 10 10 or ace 10 or a weaker 10 where he's just like, you know, has 10 5 suited and decided to three bet instead of call. So I would say that, uh, I'd say that, you know, I'd say Theo definitely has a 10 a fair bit more than uh, Haglund does. It looks like he's coming out with a pretty strong bet. Yeah, he's Maybe count like 770 or something. He's betting like he ain't scared. 745. Looks like a pretty large bet. I know you guys like to guess the amounts, but you don't have to. We'll get it eventually. <laughs> All right, sounds good. The bet is 690,000. Oh, I was off by a lot. They're already counting it out. Just one chip, really. <laughs> Theo quickly calls. That was, quite, that was quite a fast call. Gulp. By the way, Ollie has just tweeted Chris Mormon. I hope for your sake, Ollie, that wasn't a prediction of who's going to win this thing. Well said. You're way <laughs> off. <laughs> Deuce of diamonds on the river. I think it's a brick at first. But when Theo calls that fast on the turn, maybe he did pick up diamonds. 2.9 million in the pot. Jorgensen, the effective stack, with 2.8 million behind. And it's, I mean, there's a lot, of, there are a decent number of diamond hands Theo could have. Like, even if Theo just has, you know, ace five of diamonds, it's not that unreasonable to call this flop against, you know, if, if Chris is going to be, uh, you know, C betting, or sorry, if, uh, if Heglin's going to be uh, C betting. Uh, with anything he's betting with, it's not that unreasonable to call with a lot of just backdoor draws like that. So it's th th this is definitely a tough spot to be in, uh, you know, with most hands Haglund can have here. Is it totally out of the realm for Haglund to have flopped this set of queens and turned a boat? Jorgensen call. calls before the bet size is even announced. Oh. Well, the dealer pulls. Is we're using the two tens and the queen, so. Yeah, it's something like it's Theo at ace queen. Haglin, king queen. kings. King, oh wow. Kings. Wow. So that's uh yeah that's definitely a hand that uh, Haglin doesn't mind being up against there. And Haglund gets three streets of value there. 925,000 was his bet on the river. So Haglund, big chip leader now with more than 8.5 million. And Theo down to 1.8 million. And, and the, the three streets of value, but three streets, and two of them kind of thin value. Yeah, I, yeah, I would say after, you know, after that river card. Like, I think, I think when Theo calls the turn fairly quickly there, he's a, you know, he's a little, uh, a little less likely to have a 10 than sometimes. I mean, I I haven't played with Theo enough to say this. I would say that's kind of a tendency for a lot of players. You know, it's possible with Theo, it's the opposite, and his his quick calls usually mean strong hands. I'm not sure exactly, but I would say, yeah, I would say that him calling like quickly there is a little more indicative of a middling strength hand. Yeah. But no guarantee of that. So here we go, people. It's caption competition time on EPT Live. Here is the photograph that we had taken earlier on. Here are Stapes and Hartigan giving Mike McDonald our best example of the patented Timex stare down. We want you to come up with an amusing caption and we want you to tweet that caption with the hashtag EPT Live for your chance to win two box sets of poker shows. Season one of the big game on DVD plus a series of poker tutorial shows. So tweet your best suggestion with the hashtag EPT Live. Twitter only for the competition. <laughs> And we'll read out some of your suggestions a bit later on today. Uh, by the way, you're getting a lot of love on Twitter, Mike. Uh, Ryan says, great commentary by Mike McDonald. Great way to get on my Saturday grind. Well, thank you, Ryan. I, uh, I agree. Plus one to that. <laughs> Ooh, 
Yeah, very surprised at how quickly Theo called those bets on the turn and river. Yeah, I mean it is like you know the ace, the ace queen there is you know a pretty a pretty strong bluff catcher. Like it's pretty it's it's t you know it's I think it's a a tough fold to make there. I I mean I think I probably would play it the same in Theo's shoes. Yeah, I think most people would. They might uh, take a little bit longer to make that call on the river, but if you just know you're calling, like there's no point at that point. In... Yeah, and the river bet was tiny. Like I think it was you know a third pot, maybe even un yeah right around a third pot. So it's uh, just slightly under a third pot even. So it's really it really is something. Even though it looks like a value bet, your hand is just so strong. You know he could, you know he could be value betting the same hand or even a king queen sometimes. And if he's just, you know, ever bluffing at all, you're just in, you know, such a great... I mean, you're just getting such a good price. If he has any bluffs, you've got to call something like that. So here we have kind of an interesting situation, like the... Uh, where the, f like, fourth and third are just so similar in chips, where you just have two two massive stacks with, what is that, 80% of the chips, and, and two who each have, like, 10%. It's really... I think this could definitely lead to some sort of, like, you know, interesting dynamic, sort of like a game of chicken between the two short stacks. Well, Visser putting some pressure on Theo. This river bet. No snap call this time. Here I didn't really. Uh, so the turn went check. The default went check check. Visser bet turn. He bet decently big on the turn and pretty small on the river. I would say. I mean, is this I mean, a case I, of him trying to make it an easier call for a shorter stack? Uh, I mean, that's that's what I would guess here. I would guess it's likely, you know, something like, uh, you know, something like a king queen or something like that, where he's, or like, uh, you know, like a weak two pair type hand, where he thinks he thinks Theo often just has, you know, often has like a ten or something like that, and just wants to keep him in there. I guess like there, I would say there aren't that many, there aren't that many bluffs Visser would have here. I do think you know if he had. You know, a missed ace high fluster or something like if you had ace eight of clubs or something. I think he would continue betting this river, um, but I think that there still aren't that many. Like I don't think he'd be bluffing with many pairs or anything like that. And if he was like bluffing with a pair, I think he'd often be betting bigger. By the way, I can confirm 100% with absolute certainty that there are only five members of the Triple Crown Club. David Ikatai did become the fifth when he won EPT Berlin. Last Good job, year. James. <laughs> All right. I still feel bad for the getting L key. <laughs> yeah, it's usually safe to assume, you know, if there's a tournament poker accomplishment that Elkie's got it. <laughs> usually, usually a safe one to assume. Actually, I was going to say Elkie. We just moved on to the next topic of conversation so quickly that uh, I just felt it was better to move on. Also, you know, it's good to give the other people, you know, their chance in the spotlight yeah, as well. Yeah, that's true, when, you too. Know, I mean, it's Elkie's always Elkie this and Elkie that. I mean, come on. Let's, let's talk about Roland DeWolf for a change. Exactly, yeah. Tommy's happy about the outcome of that hand. Jorgensen against Hagland. He says, Sweden won, Denmark nil. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people asking, Mike. I'm sure you get asked the question all the time. I'm sure you've answered it 101 times. Why the nickname Timex? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's really not that exciting of a story. Essentially, when I was... I started playing online poker when I was uh, much less than the legal age. <laughs> and... I, I mean, I started playing... Maybe I shouldn't be saying that. But anyways, I started playing online poker a well, long time ago. Well, you were ago. playing for free at PokerStars.net, obviously. Yeah, I was playing for Play Money, PokerStars.net. Made sure that, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't really want, you know, any of the... Uh, I didn't really want any of the, say, Play Money players knowing that my, you know, Play Money identity was the same name I... Like, the same as on the forums. So I just chose something completely random. And, you know, back since I was only playing Play Money, I was still wearing a Timex watch. <laughs> it was literally like one of those 80s movies moments where someone asked your name and you looked around the room and the first thing you saw was, ah, Timex! <laughs> no, it, it literally was that. First thing that came to mind, looked down at the Timex watch, and I'm like, oh, let's see if Timex is taken. And that just, uh, I mean, as when I started traveling to tournaments, people decided to call me that rather than calling me my, you know, play money name. So they, uh, you know, they just ended up... Uh, <laughs> Timex stuck. Well, here's the problem. So then you start playing for real money, and now you're a baller because you're winning poker tournaments and final tabling left, right, and center. So do you feel compelled that you still have to have a Timex watch? I've, st I've still got a Timex at home, you know, that I use as, like, a stopwatch and stuff like that but for, like, running and stuff. But I, uh, 
I don't, I don't really wear I don't wear a Timex too often anymore. Other than that, a lot of people you know when a lot of people are disappointed that I don't. But you know, it's just a nickname. Come on, Poker Stars! Don't you think we should uh, let Timex change his name to Rolex at least at this point? I mean, <laughs> kid's a baller. He can afford it. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't end up going for the change there. One thing that's sort of funny. At one point, my dad uh, sent off a message to Timex, just asking, like, you know, mentioning, hey, uh, like, to the watch company, uh -huh. uh, not to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and basically was like, oh, you know, my, you know, my son's a pro poker player. I was wondering if you guys have, you know, any interest in like any sort of sponsorship type thing. And they kind of, they, this, the response they got was kind of of the nature. Like it was as if my you know, nickname for poker would have been just like poker dude one two three, like completely unrelated to Timex. And like, well, actually, we tend to one sec. We'll get, we'll st we have an all in here. Oh, never mind. We got a fold. Open shove from the small blind by Mantis Vizotkis. And That's a giant shove. Hang on, folded. Forty big blinds, I think. Uh, but yeah, what I was gonna say is when my dad emailed them, their response was kind of like. You know, they're like, well, actually, you know, we tend to support, you know, cycling and triathlons and swimming. We don't really view uh, poker as the, you know, endurance competition that we <laughs> that we tend to typically go for and don't necessarily feel that Timex uh, products are necessary for something like a poker tournament. So it was uh, a pretty, uh, pretty <laughs> stern decline when he emailed them. At least yeah. he got more than a generic response, more than a thank you for your interest. It, yeah, it was, a, it was definitely a very, you know, personalized email, I guess. So at least, you know. At least they're uh, they're they're looking out there. We could have all the tournament clocks saying Timex on them. Timex, <laughs> you blew <Yeah>. it. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, not you. The real <laughs> the company. Oh yeah, it's confusing. Very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who's. Google profile is bigger. I bet yours is. I bet more people are Googling you with the word Timex and Googling the watch with the word Timex. Who, I mean, who's Googling Timex the watch? Nobody. Stay yeah. relevant, watch company. <laughs> <laughs> trying my best. Trying my best to, you know, keep, keep them down there. I'm assuming they have the top hit on Google, but I'm not, I'm not sure. It's got to be close. Yeah. So Haglin was the razor before the flop. Called by Visser, who defended his big blind. Haglin doesn't continuation bet. Visser bets. Haglin folds. Sometimes it's okay just to check, check fold. Yeah, you don't always have to. Exactly, and you know I, I like I like the check fold from Haglin there, and I think that you know especially after betting flop, and then uh, check folding turn the previous time, Ruben's not going to be folding the flop that often. So I think that's actually a spot in Haglin shoes. I do like check folding a decent amount, and I also like check raising some thinnish value hands. Like I think that, I think that Ruben will be betting that flop such a large percent of the time that being able to, you know, even check raise something like, even check raising like a queen jack or king jack type hand there, I think is going to work out, you know, pretty well. And then you can also check raise some bluffs that you don't want to have to check fold. Like if you have, you know, if you have. Uh, 10-7 there or something like that. It's not It's not that unreasonable to just check raise. Your dad's online, Mike. Rick McDonald tweets to say, nice hearing your voice, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Nice, when are you calling nice home, see, Mike? Nice, nice, seeing your, nice seeing your tweets, Dad. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be home in a couple days. So Vizotskis is under the gun raise, called by Theo in the big blind. Two shorter stacks at the table battling here as Olaf Haglund tucks, tucks into what looks like quite a pleasant fruit salad. Yeah, the fruit salads here are actually really, really good, I gotta say. I'm, I'm disappointed I didn't try one until I think just yesterday when I was already out of the main event, but you know, maybe I'd be here at the final table if I had have had more fruit salads myself. Continuation bet gets the job done. By the way, a new article has just been posted on the Pokestars blog, and Howard Swains informs us that Mr. Thorgensen, Mr. Thorgensen, Mr. <laughs> Jorgensen Sr. is in the house. Theo's dad is now railing the final table. Oh, eat that, Rick McDonald. <laughs> but... There's also a little piece about why Olaf Haglund accidentally managed to get a good night's sleep before the final tables. So you can read up on that, courtesy of Mr. Swains, on the pokestarsblog.com. Plenty of suggestions coming through for that caption competition. We'll reel some off soon. In the meantime, if you are looking for the free roll password, and trust me, there are lots of people after that information, oval is the word you need. O-V-A-L, all lowercase. Oval is the password for today's EP to Life free roll, which begins 
in about five and a half hours' time. Sorry, four and a half hours' time. The Satskis comes over the top of Ruben's raise. He's going to win the pot. So, yeah, I mean, when I was talking earlier about how it would be a game of chicken between the two short stacks, it seems like I was very wrong about that. I think Visakis is, you know, very much playing for first more so than playing for third. Uh, between seeing the open shove and then that 40 big blind reshove, I think it's, you know, safe. It's safe to assume that he's playing a, a higher variant style than I would have originally guessed. Which is odd because he was playing a pretty low variant style when we kicked things off. He limped a few times actually on his button and uh, and the cutoff. It, so it could very well be that he's just you know had the right hands to be doing it with. Like you know he may have had East Queen there in a middle middle pair of the previous one or hands where you know it's they sort of make sense what he did. Like if he if the whole cards were shown then I'd be able to make you know a right. stronger deduction about that. How high his variance really is. Yeah exactly. You know if he. If, it, if, when in, if, if when we see whole cards or something, if it was like, uh, if he had 8-7 suited there, then I would have been very wrong in my original prediction. If he had ace-king there, then I'm, you know, maybe only a little bit wrong. <laughs> Nick D says, love listening to Timex. Victor says, great commentary, all of you guys. You're helping me to overcome drunkenness while laying in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Glad we could help. I think he means overcoming a hangover. I'm not quite <laughs> sure it's easy to overcome drunkenness. <laughs> Actually, the only thing that can overcome drunkenness is time, <laughs> X. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> I lost the tweet, but one of our Lithuanian viewers informed me that uh, Mantis Vizotskis original intention, if he made the final table, was to wear a false mustache, but he settled for the bow tie instead. <laughs> I'm assuming there's some sort of story behind uh, why he was going to do that. I guess he, he just wanted to do a thing if he made the final table. I mean, we did have a gentleman in Prague, Mike, who decided to wear a lion costume at the final table of the tournament. That's pretty badass. Did he end up doing very well? No. <laughs> <laughs> the guy in the costume never does. All in and a call. Vizoskis raised, Visa 3-bet. Vizoskis shoved and Visa calls. Ace-queen against king-queen. The king queen is Vizotskis' hand, and he is the player at risk. Fairly high variance. Yeah, yeah. So I was uh, very much wrong in my prediction. He wants to go big or go home. Yeah, and probably about three quarters of the time, this will be going home. Sure enough, Ruben, a three to one favorite. The good news is the three-handed match can't possibly go on as long as it did at the World Series this year. It, yeah, it could go. I mean, honestly, this could go a while. I think this, I don't want to jinx it or anything, but I think it's something like, like this three-handed could take like nine hours or something. Which we is still. Lose, we have to lose Vitsaskis <laughs> first. So one card to come. Yeah, three hours is a long time. So we lose Mantis Vitsaskis if it's not a king on the river. It is a king! Oh, it is a king, and the Lithuanian doubles up. High variance, come on. <laughs> Vizotskis doubles up to over 5 million. Ruben Vista down to 4.5 million. Yeah. Theo Jorgensen can't love that. Theo nursing a stack of 1.3 million. Just over a 20 big blind stack. That's a, that's a big pot, and that's definitely going to change the dynamic here. Like, the biggest thing there is that, you know, now now Theo's kind of a, can be a little bit more, like, sort of comfortable in the sense that he doesn't really have any competition for third. Like, he's just, you know, if he sees a plus JPV spot, take it kind of thing. Yeah. And then, whereas on the other hand, Ruben and Mantis now kind of, you know, are in a spot where they'd rather you know, be able to survive to get get heads up kind of thing. Like, if I were in Ruben's shoes, after seeing how High Variance Mantis has been playing, I would be playing, like, a little a little bit tighter. And then Olaf is in a spot where he can, you know, do his best to try to run over the final table right now when he has such a commanding chip lead. Now, this isn't the only final table that's happening right now. Actually, the High Roller, uh, the high roller final table is happening at the same time. James, what do you say you give me and Timex a little alone time? You go on down to the floor... Give us a little update from the high roller. What do you say? 
I'll let you live out your man crush, Joe. But also, <laughs> last time we heard from the High Roller, they'd only just got down to the final eight. The official final table bubble had burst. It's about time we actually brought our viewers up to speed with what is going down in that tournament. All right, so we're going to send James on down there. Me and uh, Mike are going to handle things up here from the booth. We've got three-way action. Sots gets the original Razor. Jorgensen checks. And it checks around. Nine on the turn. Theo decides to lead. And he bet he bet pretty small here, which like you know lead, like leads me to think that he's not necessarily like super strong or anything. Like if I was in Ruben's shoes, I don't mind calling, you know, with a pair. Top, like yeah, top pair, two pair type hands. Like I would I would I wouldn't be calling with like a nine or something. Like I think Jorgensen's likely to have like a King Jack or a nine eight type hand. Um but yeah, I think that I, th I think that af I think after that small bet, I'd be fairly surprised to see it followed up with a big river bet. But okay, <laughs> I'm wrong. Looks like I'm wrong again. Well, that's only 300. Okay, so yeah, 300 is not a huge bet by any means. Looks like Ruben might be done with this. Yeah. Okay, I would I would I would, I would guess Jorgensen had the 10 there. Jorgensen takes down that pot. About 600k, 580. I don't know if you guys can hear that or not. He said he really wasn't rooting for yeah. Mantis Vysotskis. Yeah, that's one thing I always find like sort of just fun about live final tables is how every single pot that happens even the ones you're not involved in you're so financially interested in the outcome of the pot like you're always you know even if it's even if it's like one of your good friends across the table you're often just you know rooting against them just for your own self-interest and it's it's sick how that ends up happening but yeah i mean know, there's so many good sweats not just you know not just your cards but everybody's yeah and even non all ins like you're just thinking okay like you have a set you have a higher set kind of thing like you can all you're, there's always like you know something, some way the pot could get big that you can hope for. I mean, just even when the cards are being dealt out, you're like, if you're <laughs> yeah. Theo, you're like, please just deal aces, kings and queens to everyone else at the <laughs> table and give me seven deuce, please, please, please. <laughs> exactly, yeah, and you know, get get heads up, guarantee, you know, two and a half times what he's got right now. Why not? All right, we're gonna give the free roll password out again. It is oval. Today's free roll password is oval. And we decided to not do tube stations anymore, but instead we uh, made the password after the shape of Hardigan's head. <laughs> Oval. <laughs> Who let Van Percy in the commentary box, says Sam Clayton. I don't know what that means. I probably shouldn't say it. A lot of people giving Mantis... A hard time for being a river rat. <laughs> Some guy wants me to shut up about the limping thing. It's kind of worth noting at a final table when a player limps. Yeah, I guess I, I didn't really see where, you know, where the limps necessarily occurred. Oh, it was at the very beginning. Okay. Because yeah. what I was going to say is, you know, sometimes I think, like, sometimes I think limping can be pretty effective. Like, watching the, you know, the three-handed from the World Series this year, I think Greg Merson's limping was really what gave him a large edge against the two guys he was playing against. And, you know, under the right dynamics, it can be good. It's not something I do a ton. I think that there's some people who implement it better than I do. But there, there can be some spots for it. Glad hand was raised by Theo Jorgensen. Three bet all in from Ruben Visser. And Visser's going to take down that pot. Now, just a few seconds ago, we uh, sent James Hardigan on down to the tournament floor not to cover this event, but the other final table that's happening, the high roller final table. And we've got James raring to go. Hardigan, buddy, what can you tell us?
about the high roller final table? Always raring to go, Joe. Well, I found a man in the know. It's Rick Dacey, staff writer at the PokerStars blog. Let's just set the scene over to this side. We have the final table of the main event. These are the players you have been watching, and we've got the rail that is building here. Plenty of people inside the Grove de Victoria Casino watching the live feed on the screens and also watching the guys live at the final table. Also watching the final table behind us, the high roller final table, Rick. Yep. Lots of money here, 436,000 for first. Everyone's guaranteed at least 40,000. Uh, Vicky Conn, Team Poker Stars Pro, is currently uh, the shortest stack, but she just won a decent sized pot against Gotham uh, Shabawal. So um, it's, yeah, any, anyone can take out the moment, but leading is uh, Talal Shikurchi, who anyone following high roller events will, will have heard of before. He is not a professional player, but he is uh, a superstar of the hedge fund management world here in the UK. So, yeah, definitely someone with a head for numbers and plenty of cojones to go with it. Yeah, it's Alal, obviously a familiar face to anyone who's watched our super high roller TV shows. And there is the trophy they're playing for. I mean, Rick, you mentioned the first prize. You also get the nice shiny trophy. And it's a beautiful one. It's, it's got a gold tinge. It's got the Pokestar spade. What more could you want? So an interesting mix of characters at this final table, and it wasn't that long after play begun today that we lost Dimitar Danchev in ninth. So he's sure. the official final table bubble boy. Yeah. I can't help but notice it's still eight-handed after what must be some time. Well, uh, I know Con doubled up recently. Uh, she just won a decent-sized pot where um, Shabawal had to fold Ace King face up on a ten-high board. So yeah, she's going to be manoeuvring to sort of climb up and uh, try and get into the top three, obviously, because that's where the big money is. So they're going to play down to a winner today in the high roller, a 10k buy-in event. And of course, we're going to play down to a winner today in the main event, taking place over there. So back to Joe and Mike calling the action in the booth. Thanks very much, James. Still eight-handed in that high roller. Mike, you played the high roller as well, right? Yeah, I was actually fortunate enough to get to play it twice. <laughs> oh, the old reload. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those, I really enjoy those high roller events that they have at you know, every EPT stop. Like they're... You know, there's such, I mean, there's such like good payouts to the top couple places for you know a tournament that only takes a few days, and you get a good mix of you know professionals and recreational players. So I, I really enjoy getting to play them. Nice little wham bam, thank you, man. Big payout in just a, what two or three day event, so you don't have to have the seven day marathon. Yeah, like I was, uh, I was talking to Talal, the guy who's chip leader, and he mentioned, you know, he couldn't get the time off work to play the EPT main, so he didn't even play the main, just came and played the high roller. And there's a lot of play people who do that, I think, where, you know, it's just more, you know, more time effective if you're, you know, a pretty busy person and don't have the time to commit to playing a week-long event. Right, and that works out well for you guys because you would rather have the weekend warriors oh, playing uh, the event. Absolutely, like it makes it, you know, it makes it, it makes it enjoyable to have a you know a good mixture of players all right this this pot raised before the flop by Olaf Haglin called by Visser and Visotskis and I bet by Visotskis called by Haglin Kara would say Visotskis is like like probably has a hand the majority of the time um, but especially after getting called by two, did he? Oh, he only got called by one player. Yeah, the original uh, razor called. Yeah, he's. I mean, I would say he has something here the vast majority of the time. And if he doesn't have something here, I would absolutely bet with it. Like if I had, if I let out with like a king five or something like that, I would definitely continue betting. I think that, I think Heglin definitely will have a nine a lot less often. And you know, even with his, you know, with an overpair here, it's just so difficult to continue. His bet size here is. Is fairly small. Um, it, could, it could be that he, you know, he wants to. It could be he wants to keep him in the pot, uh, or it could be you know he doesn't have much and just wants to make it cheaper. It's called again. I think if Vasquez led this flop, which would have been out of flow. Possible haggling continued. Maybe I didn't follow the action right. No, yeah, he did. He did lead out, and then he checked. He checked the river relatively quickly here. Um, I would guess. I would guess if he was bluffing, he wouldn't, you know, check it so quickly. Um, 
trying to think of what types of hands. I think it's I think it's not unreasonable to be to like to check raise this river if he has a boat. Oh. And I guess he he looks a little bit disappointed by the outcome there. It's possible he had something like an eight six or something like that. Right, just has to fall to the river bet. Yeah. Counterfeited, possibly. Yeah, during the hand like during the hand before the river bet, he seemed like, you know, he was interested in the hand at least. Like it didn't seem like he was, you know, just had like eight high and knew he was like gonna be folding the pot kind of thing. Like I, I would guess he had at least something throughout that hand. Eight six would be my best guess, but I I can't say for certain. Well it's probably the hand you're most likely to be disappointed on by the river and just no <laughs> way you can call. Exactly, yeah. A combination of, you know, disappointed by the river and also hand he's likely to lead out on that flop, I think. Still appreciate your contributions on Twitter and on the emails. Nuts at Pokestars.tv if you're emailing. Tag your tweets, EPT Live. Richard says, thanks for a great broadcast, guys, with good and funny guests. Going to play some live poker and follow the action on the Pokestars app. Hashtag life is good. Do you ever find yourself watching poker on TV, Mike, when you're actually playing? Um, not as much as a lot of players do. Like, I think, uh, I mean, s some of my friends watch a lot of live poker, or watch a lot of the, like, broadcasts. Like, when I live down, uh, when I go to Vegas every summer, like, Lucky Chewy, uh, who I live at his house, watches, a ton, like, a ton of televised poker. So, you know, when he's watching it, I'll often watch along. Uh, but as far as the broadcasts I watch, it's usually just... Something where, you know, a friend of mine makes a final table, so I'll watch the broadcast, just, you know, see if they played any cool hands. Overall, I watch probably less televised poker than most people. Do you watch the TV shows that you feature in? Uh, yeah, I I haven't seen... The last one I was in was it would have been the Barcelona Super High Roller, which aired in the last month or so. I haven't seen that, but I'm, I'm sure I'll watch it at some point in the next little while. It's always nice to see. Like, I've, I've heard that I get owned a few times on this on this next broadcast, so it's... It's all. It's always nice to see those hands, so that you know how to like fix things up in the future. So this is a three bet and a call. Vizotskis. It looks like a four bet. Well, Vizotskis open was to one fifty. Yeah, sure three is. bet to three seven five. Vizotskis does respond with a four bet, six hundred twenty-five thousand total. And uh, pretty is, small four that's bet. Incredibly small. Which is why I thought it was a call. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean if I like the against seeing like so one thing a lot of tournament players never do is when they three bet and someone four bets them, a lot of them just never ever call. So people just start making it smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where, you know, Vizakis he basically uh sorry, Vizakis, uh he just like basically min four bet there. If I were in uh like Heglin shoes, I would be more willing to three bet some middle strength hands that I could call a four bet with. Like something like uh, something like a king queen that you might normally just just call the open with. It's reasonable to three bet. So then he's going to call you with hands like king ten and stuff like that. And then if he four bets you, you're getting such a good price, and he's probably bluffing sometimes. So you can just call that as well. So I think that's a, a decent adjustment that you can make to the players that uh, that four bet so small is three betting a less polarized range than you normally would, and just three betting more good hands, I guess. Good hands, at least hands that have some solid equity. If you can, yeah, like instead of you know instead of three betting you know eight four suited, three bet eight seven suited, and then call the four bet kind of thing. Andrew Chen, your good friend Mike is watching the live stream. Not just for you, but he appreciated that live update on the floor and says Rick Dacey's voice sounds exactly like the extra normal text to speech voice. It's awesome. He's even provided a little link for us to listen to that later on. So we have a Rick Dacey sound like courtesy of Andrew Chen. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Check that out. <laughs> yeah, I'll check that out on the rig too. <laughs> and once again, for those of you who joined late and are wondering about what happened during the early levels of this final table. An update's just gone up on the PokerStars blog explaining Chris Mormon's demise in eighth place. So make sure you read the words that have been typed by our friends and colleagues at the blog. Yeah. And once again, just as we thank the graphics guys and the rest of our production team, we thank Stephen, Rick and Howard for all their hard work over the last few days as well.
don't worry, as we draw to the end of this seven-day pokathon, a reminder that we're going to do it all again from EPT Berlin, the penultimate leg of Season 9 of the European Poker Tour. We kick things off on the 21st of April, which is a Sunday, and we'll see it through to the following Saturday, seven days of live coverage from the Berlin leg of the Tour. You going to Berlin, Mike? Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Berlin's always one of my favorite stops, so I'm, uh, I'm excited for that one. What are your plans in the meantime? Are you staying in Europe or heading back home? No, no just uh, heading back to Canada in a couple of days. Um, I'm actually one of my best friends is going to school over here, so I'm, vi I'm visiting him for the next few days, and then just back to Canada for a month or whatever it happens to be, and I'll be back here for Berlin and Monte Carlo. That Canadian passport's strong. You can pop in whenever you want. Some of the other... When you're American, you tend to maybe sometimes have to stick around. Exactly, yeah. He's like, you know, you're pretty much free to go where you want, so yeah. it works It works out all right. This is raised to 135,000. Re-raised by Theo Jorgensen, the table short stack. His three bet is to 280,000. Yeah, if I was if I was in Ruben shoes, I would I would have not expected Theo to be small three betting like that very often. Which I think means, like, I mean, I think most people in Theo's shoes there just have good hands, like a disproportionate amount of the time. I would say if Theo was light there, I really, really like that re-raise. I think that, uh, I think it's a spot, especially when he's in that, when there's no other short stacks, where he should be mixing it up more than a lot of people would be. And I think if, if he was light in that spot, I think that's a great re-raise. I do love the fact that with EPT final tables, no matter how intense the action, no matter how good the poker, people will always obsess over who the players look like. <laughs> and Marius tweets to say Theo looks like Vigo Mortensen. A little bit. Well, they both have Scandinavian blood, but yeah, I, I don't really see it myself, to be honest. Yeah, I, would, I, wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have made that connection, but yeah, maybe a little bit of a resemblance. That raise and take it for Theo from the small blind. 23 minutes left on this level. And the blinds go up to 40-80 with a 10k ante. Is that a significant rise for anyone other than Theo? Uh, not particularly. Like it's, uh, I mean, it is like the like 30-60 to 40-80 is one of the you know bigger percentage jumps that you uh, uh, that you will see at this stage of the tournament. Uh, but it's still. It's not going to be crazy, especially when stacks are so deep. Like it'll just mean instead of having you know 80 big blinds, they have 60 big blinds kind of thing. But yeah, it should, it should definitely you know speed play up a little bit. Like that's definitely a much bigger blind increase than say 2550 to 3060. You know, uh, kind of a funny story. I kind of, I've told it once or twice, but we always have new people listening. Is that Mike was with me, James, at that Barcelona Real Madrid game that we went to, <laughs> where we were slugging beers. We were just getting drunk, really drunk. Like <laughs> as fast as possible, like just hammering down beers before finally I was like, guys, I think I'm a full-blown alcoholic because I can't get drunk anymore. I don't know what's happening, but I've had like seven beers and I'm not... Come to find out... <laughs> They were non-alcoholic beers, and no. we were we were just getting them by the tray. And we were we, the first <laughs> round, we bought twelve of them. We're like, hey, look, it's gonna be a long game. We need twelve beers. <laughs> the guy had no problem selling and, us twelve beers without telling us. And yeah, we were wondering, you know, why we've got this big soccer match, and like, you know, hardly any lineup, hardly anyone's drinking beer. Like, we're <laughs> we're the only people getting. Everyone's you know. drinking Coca-Cola. We're like, what's going on? Now yeah. you see, if you followed soccer and aware of certain incidents over the last 20 years you'd know why alcohol <laughs> is not served in the stadiums number one spectator sport in the world number one spectator death sport in the world also <laughs> and then uh, another funny thing happened is that mike and i were chatting most of the game yeah neither, somehow ne neither of us are uh, are big soccer guys by any means and it was it was a big game it was uh, it was el clasico which you know f i told friends of mine i went who are soccer friends they freaked out fans, right? and they were like they thought i was so lucky they were asking what the experience was like and i just said you know drinking non-alcoholic beer and talking <laughs> to stapes so yeah we yeah. were chatting the whole time and then th this guy in front of, <laughs> in front of us turned around and shushed us which I thought was a little, like, I was like, okay, if he's really into the game, fine. Like, you can shush someone out of the game. You know why he shushed us? Because he was reading a book. He wasn't even watching the game. We were disturbing the enjoyment of the book he was reading. 
I mean, at least on the bright side, even if we didn't get much out of the game, I'm sure we got more out of it than <laughs> right. he did. Yeah, there's the one the one guy who's less excited about El Clasico than we are. So it was uh, we got seated in the right section at least. <laughs> I seem to have opened the floodgates for poker player lookalikes now. <laughs> Liam suggesting that Visser looks a bit Tarantino-esque. I, I see that one a He's little bit more. got the chin going for it, him, yeah. It wouldn't have been one I noticed, but I can I can definitely see a little more of a resemblance. Walter suggesting that he resembles a certain supporting actor from Moonraker. I think he's drawing a Richard Keel Jaws comparison. To, to which player? Visser. Me. Nee. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't actually seen that one. Well, Grony has just sent a photograph of a younger Vigo Mortensen and says, seriously, you don't see it? And I have to say, okay, in that photograph, there is a certain Jorgensen-esque quality in, Theo, in uh, Vigo Mortensen's face. Yeah, a little bit, so, like similar complexions, a little similar hair, a little more similar than I would have guessed. In that they're both terribly handsome, then yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Haglin the razor this hand, Vysotskis defends. 5, 8, 10, two diamonds. Check, check. Ace on the turn. Two spades, two diamonds. Vasakis checked this turn, I mean, from, from what I saw, it looked like he checked this turn almost abnormally quick, which I think is often indicative of someone who has a decently strong or a super weak hand. So it's super weak. Insta-fold. The Dozer okay. tweets to say, did you just say soccer, lol? Yes, Dozer, because to me, football is the American game, and I despise the sport. But thank you for your <laughs> tweet. Uh, Claw's got a good one. He says, do you remember when Theo Jorgensen was fighting Harrison Ford on that rooftop in the future? That was pretty cool. It does look a little like Rutger Hauer. A little bit from that movie. I'll give you that one. And for those of you asking about other guest commentators, obviously we're honored to have Timex with us in the booth. We are expecting Chris Moneymaker from Team PokerStars Pro, although he's gone a little bit AWOL. Uh, later on, we hope to be joined by Daniel Negranu and Lex Veldhaus. Which pro are we missing? Moneymaker. You know I've been meaning to ask him? Is that his real name? <laughs> that is crazy, right? His name is Moneymaker, and he won the World Series of Poker. That is outrageous. How has no one ever noticed that? <laughs> Action on Johnny Ray's a lot. Oh my god, if it's people not having a problem with Theo's chip stackling, it's the complaints about the uh, left-handed dealer. Seriously, it's all it's all the super sleuths out there. They got to prove to us that they saw something that no one else did. Are we seriously going to discriminate against left-handed people and say you can't deal? Thank you super sleuths. Yep. And this is a 3 bet from our chip leader who's Got over nine million in chips at this point. Two to one lead over his nearest opponent. Mantis Vysotskis still second on the leaderboard with 4.4 .4 million. Visser just shy of 4 million. Jorgensen on 1.4 million. So here we go, a reminder of our caption competition on EPT Live. We had this photograph taken a little bit earlier on today. It's Joe and I attempting the Mike McDonald stare down. So if you have a caption that you'd like to put to this photo, tag it EPT Live on Twitter. Here are some early suggestions. By the way, this is why I find the Mike McDonald stare down to be so hilarious because <laughs> this Mike McDonald you guys see right here, that's the Mike McDonald I know. Always <laughs> laughing, smiling, affable guy. Then to see that monster at the table, <laughs> that's why it's so weird. So here are some yeah. captions. Harris says, Stapes and James are saying, Mike, don't move. You've got an aerial coming out of your head. Uh, this is from Winner Pimp. Mike thinks they will never find out I just farted. <laughs> Christian says, to all the listeners, there actually is a lamp. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ant-Man. I, I retweeted that earlier. I know. Still not <laughs> sure what happened to the toothbrushes from day five, but they have their suspicions. Uh, I love this. Todd Mercer's one. Mercia sent us. I like that one. <laughs> and this is from John the Book.
Timex manages to successfully chat up Kate the dealer. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I first met uh, Check Check here on the flop after it's been raised by Vitsotskis before the flop. Check Check again. I met Kate the dealer in London two years ago, and I actually, there was a big Twitter wall then, and I tweeted, hey, pretty blonde dealer standing right in front of this Twitter wall, will you go out with me tonight? <laughs> and how'd that work out for you? You guys lived happily ever after? Yep, we're still together today. Congrats. Ruben bets the river. Yeah, the, the Twitter wall is always, it's always fun when you have like that kind of, you know, dynamic where people are tweeting things just so it gets up on the wall so oh, that the yeah. people at their table go to try to see it. It's funny. Not flush. That's good. That was a strong hand. Flopped it. Only got one street of value. So Sean says, I'm out watching the football and watching EPT Live on the mobile, which is destroying my 3G allowance. So technically, I am paying Mike McDonald to teach me. You're paying someone for Mike McDonald to teach you. And Daniel says, how can you not taste the difference between normal beer and alcohol-free beer? I just thought it was terrible. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, did, the, I just had never had non-alcoholic beer before. And also in our, also in our defense, uh, by the time we had you know, the second beers, they were already so warm that we just thought it was terrible because it was warm rather than being terrible because it was non-alcoholic. Exactly. So it was, you know, it was, it was doubly terrible. What do we think of Ruben uh, waiting until the river to bet there? Does he have any choice? I mean, is that basically his only chance to, to, to try to get value? Um, I mean, I think that, like, I think it's, he certainly can bet turn as well. And I think on a turn card like that, he's going to get, uh, like, he's going to get called a lot. Um, but I guess he was thinking that maybe, uh, that maybe Mantis would be betting the turn a lot. So I guess he just wanted to fire the check raise and then bomb river mm -hmm. kind of thing. He just made it. Yeah, just right. It, yeah, exactly. Like, I think it's. Uh, I think both options are fine there. Jason asks if you're staying in town to play WPT London, Mike. And obviously you've already told us that you're heading back to Canada soon. Do you think more pros would have stuck around had it been a full-on WPT rather than just one of the national events? Yeah, I mean, I actually, uh, I actually just heard about the event like, uh, you know. A, yesterday or something but I am actually playing the event um, so I think more people would have stuck around if it was yeah bigger and more advertised but you know when it's a good 1500 pound buy-in it's like a half hour you know drive away or something like that I definitely you know and I'm here anyways I may as well play it but yeah I think that I think that having it have you know the official like WPT title would definitely you know get a you know get at least a few dozen even maybe a hundred more pros out there which I don't even necessarily want. <laughs> Haglund raising under the gun here. Folded to Theo in the small blind. Free bet. We gotta hand it to Theo. Like he is definitely like a combination of like the the times he's choosing to three bet and the sizings he's choosing to use. I would say is you know not not typical of someone over 40. And I think it's very very good what he's doing right here. Like I think he's applying a lot of pressure in exactly that situation where you know he's he's fine to play a little higher variance here. So I I really like the way that Theo's playing right now. AJ's really glad you're here, Mike. He says, great listening to Mike McDonald on EPT Live. Makes me have to listen to the other dolts in the booth less. <laughs> Strong. <laughs> uh, more lookalike suggestions. Martin thinks that Vissa looks like Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> I still think Tarantino is the best suggestion we've had. Yeah, I think, that, I think he definitely looks similar to him. Mike, you actually you forgot your wallet on this trip, right? Yeah. How are you getting by in a foreign country without your wallet? Yeah, I mean, this was, uh, I mean, well, it started out with a little bit of uh, identity theft. Uh, basically, what happened is my sister drove me here, 
and she's to like, the airport. To the airport. Okay. Yeah, not to London. <laughs> to, to the airport. And then she's like, "Oh, you know, Mike, you can take my you can take my credit card." So you know, I was a little nervous as I was like, you know, paying for a meal, pretending to be Emily McDonald. <laughs> but but uh, you know, they, they fortunately the lady didn't check it out. And then I decided like, you know, she hasn't traveled before, and if I use her credit yeah. card regularly. Or for anything or even once. Yeah, it's likely it's going to get, like, shut down. So I'm like, all right, you know, I just went to an ATM, took out, you know, enough money to, like, get, like, take the tube to my hotel, and then just started, like, well, so I, as far as going out to bars and stuff, I need to use my passport. That's the only thing I have. And then as far as, you know, CC, credit card roulette, I need to buy out because I don't have a credit card. <laughs> and, then, and then as far as... Uh, and then as far as, like, getting money, I just, like, you know, traded... So when I finally got to the hotel, I traded someone, you know, stars money for pounds. So I've just, you know, been uh, just paying cash for things. But uh, it's definitely, you know, if, if it weren't... If this weren't a poker stop, like, if I was here for a random trip, like, I don't know what I would have done not without you a wallet. You just hope that you have some fans. Yeah, exactly. Got to, you know, hit up Twitter and hope that <laughs> hope that someone would uh, would be able to help me out. But yeah, I was I was definitely you know definitely fortunate. But then to you get cashed in this, right? So now you uh, did you skim a little bit off of that? Uh, no, I just deposited to stars. <laughs> but um, I'm I'm doing all right. It's uh, I've got I've got cash sorted out for the rest of the trip. All right. But yeah, definitely you know it definitely could, it could have gone worse. Like I was I was thinking you know if the credit card didn't work, I have no idea how I'm going to get across London with. You know, zero dollars. Yeah, my, my first my first trip to London actually, I um, was told that my cell phone would work when I got here, and that my credit cards would work when I got here, and neither one did. And so I landed in Heathrow and just like was in a cold sweat because I had no cash, none of my cards worked, and my phone didn't work. And then you had to do the annoying Stapes Tears play, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's got to be terrible. I stared, I stared down the cab driver and then teared up, and he drove me here for free. That works out all right. Yeah. By the way, a warning from Poker City that a heads-up involving Ruben Visser could be a long one. In a recent festival, he won the PLO event after a heads-up battle of 10 hours. Jeez. Gulp. I didn't even know that was possible in PLO. It must have been like 7 million blinds deep or something. Yeah, those pots get big pretty fast. I don't know how you do that for 10... That's just a lot of... <laughs> it's a lot of trading pots, I guess. I keep almost reading random comments on Twitter then realizing they're actually caption competition suggestions. <laughs> it would be nice if you guys would specify that they're captions. Yeah, we tried not to confuse you by coming up with an alternative hashtag, but yeah, if you can just put caption in the tweet, it will help me because um, sometimes I get confused very easily. <laughs> Theo 3 bessing again. Adam <laughs> likes your Canadian accent, Mike. <laughs> Slotskis raised under the gun to 120k. Theo's 3 bet to 275 from the big blind. Oh, Soren says, just because Theo looks like a grey wolf, he's actually not 40 yet. All in and a call. Wow. A6 was the shove. King Jack, the call. Both a little light considering how fast the money went in. I guess Theo can't legitimately three bet fold in this spot, Mike. No, I think he's I think he's got to either, you know, he's got to either three bet, you know, three bet cram or three bet call. Like it's or just call free fold. Like if there were more shorter stacks, probably calling is the option. As it is, if Mantis is opening a lot, I think he's just got to find a way of getting it in. By the way, Theo is actually 41, so you're wrong, Soren, and Mike was right, so meh. Let's see if Theo can survive here. <laughs> At least you're not up against Ace-King or Ace-Jack. Exactly. It's almost a flip. King-Jack suited very live, 44% equity, but Theo does need to hit to survive. And there is pretty, a Jack good on start. the flop. Excellent start. So now it's Mantis who needs to improve. Theo says, I'll take a jack. Yeah. And he gets it! Or he said, all right. Is that all you have to do, is just say, I'll take a jack and just peels off? It's over on the turn. Mantis drawing dead. And Theo Jorgensen gets the oh double my, up with quads that on easy, the yeah. river. Four jacks for Theo. 
and a stack now of nearly 3 million. 2.83, he has drawn level with Mantis Vizotskis after doubling through him. Unfortunately, he can't call for any more cards now for the rest of the tournament. <laughs> And yeah, that's. I mean, this is a this is a really good thing to have happen for Olaf. Like now he can apply even more pressure to the remaining players, and it's you know not it. And I'm sure Ruben was rooting pretty hard against that as well. Like now he's, if I were in Ruben's shoes, even though I have direct position on Olaf, I would probably be playing fairly solid. It's because Lithuanians have the power of mind control. <laughs> Five minutes left on the level. And still four-handed with Theo Jorgensen surviving and doubling up. By the way, Jose on Twitter says, Sarah Grant looking hot in the background. Give her a shout-out for me. Not only do we give her your shout-out, but uh, we've got word. <laughs> wow, on cue. <laughs> on cue. Well, that's that's going on YouTube. <laughs> that's better than any joke I could possibly make. So I'm just going to shut up. <laughs> just got upstaged by someone who didn't even know she was on camera. That was well played. Very well played. <laughs> Jose, you nailed it. Well, David Ash from Lithuania says, guys, what do you think of Vizotskis' game today? Mike, from what you've seen, you kind of predicted he'd play a very different game to the one we saw him play. Yeah, I've, I've been, I've been, uh, I mean, I haven't been tuned in for, uh, for too long. I would say, uh, so far, I would disagree with a few of the hands he's played. Uh, but again, I've only seen, you know, I've only seen, you know, a third of the final table so far. So I can't really, I can't really comment too strongly, but... Of the hands I've seen, I haven't been, I haven't been too impressed. Hold on a second. Lithuanians are very passionate people. Let's just find something positive to say, just for your own safety, Mike. What do you think of the bow tie? It's uh, it's very classy and it looks, it looks great. I'm a little jealous right here. Yes, exactly. Classy looks great. We're all jealous. Calm down, Lithuania. So Haglund's opening raise called by Vissa on the button. Check, check on the flop, and Haglund wins it with a bet on the turn. Still the chip leader at this final table with nine and a half million. A big lead over Visser, who's got 4.3 million. And then we've got Theo Jorgensen on 2.79 million. And just behind him, the aforementioned Lithuanian player, Mantis Pazotskis, with 2.74 million. Mika, Milka writes in to say, on the subject of doppelgangers, could you ask Mike if he agrees that Theo Jorgensen looks a fair bit like Pratush Badiga? <laughs> Yeah, so Pratush is my roommate, and I would say uh, I would say Mika couldn't be further off. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I admire good lookalikes, but I really like bad lookalikes. So those are some. Of, those are some of the best for sure. That was uh, that one was unexpected. Hold it to Theo on the button. And he's raising. 130,000 total. Yeah, I've got to say to Mika that, you know, I think his doppelganger game is about as good as Sea Beast thinks his poker game is. Ah. And obviously. People asking on Twitter what happened to the hairy beast, Steve O'Dwyer, what happened to Chris Mormon. We are already down to four. They've busted. They're out. They're gone. If you want to catch up on the action so far, remember, reports are available on the PokerStars blog. We'll recap what's happened so far. We come back from the tournament break, which is only a minute and a half away. Remember when Steve Bartley was in here earlier and he said that Olaf, and no offense to Olaf, but being sort of the extra... Like the guy no one really recognizes. No one's really, you know, he's only got a few results uh, prior to this. I think his biggest score ever was for, he's got a lifetime earnings, according to us, almost six grand. So, uh, and I said, well, you know, sometimes the extra ends up winning it. Well, he's got nine and a half million <laughs> in chips right now. He's doing all right. Yeah. Ruben Visser, second most chips with 4.2 million. So... 
And, and that's what always happens, you know, in these in these EPTs is that there's, you know, there's plenty of people who just destroy it at poker who, because they don't play the live circuit, end up being kind of unknown. Like, for all you know, you know, he's, you know, winning or losing 700,000 pounds a day every day playing PLO or something. Like, you, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't, when you don't really know much about someone's identity, you often, uh, you often can't necessarily, you know, rule them out. Like a lot of the a lot of the best poker players in the world are are relatively unknowns who, you know, don't make their identities well known for, you know, tax purposes or something like that. And, you know, it's you can you can never really rule out the unknown guy basically. Wow. Steve Hughes says for the older viewer, Vissa looks like Fergal Sharkey and Theo looks like David Hunter from Crossroads. Even I'm not old enough to appreciate those ones. <laughs> Actually, I do actually know Fergal Sharkey because after being a pop singer, he then became head of the Radio Authority. So that level comes to an end. The tournament's heading on a break, and we say goodbye to Mike Timex McDonald with a lot of thanks and a lot of appreciation on Twitter for your efforts over this level, Mike. Good stuff. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show. Look forward to seeing you at EPT Berlin. We're back with the final table of EPT London after this break. More live coverage as we play down to a winner on the PokerStars.net European Poker Tour.